three into the chapter. This is the fifth of our studies in the book of Judges, and uh, it'll be quite difficult to follow tonight if you don't have a Bible with you, so try and look on with somebody else, try and share with, with somebody nearby so you can follow this story. We've looked at a number of the judges, and this is a very unusual episode in the story of God's deliverers. Abimelech, son of Jerub Baal, that's Gideon, went to his mother's brothers in Shechem and said to them, and to all his mother's clan, ask all the citizens of Shechem, which is better for you, to have all seventy of Gideon's sons rule over you, or just one man? Remember, I am your flesh and blood. And when the brothers repeated all this to the citizens of Shechem, they were inclined to follow Abimelech. For they said, He is our brother. And they gave him seventy shekels of silver from the temple of Baal Berith, and Abimelech used it to hire reckless adventurers who became his followers. And he went to his father's home in Ophrah, and on one stone murdered his seventy brothers, the sons of Gideon. But Joham, the youngest son, escaped by hiding. Then all the citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo gathered beside the great tree at the pillar in Shechem to crown Abimelech king. And when Jotham was told about this, he climbed up on the top of Mount Gerizim and shouted to them, Listen to me, citizens of Shechem, so that God may listen to you. And then he tells a little story. And it's really a fable, a bit like uh, one of our Aesop's fables. And apparently the Israelites loved riddles, as did um, most of the mid Easterners in ancient times. Here's a little story. One day the trees went out to anoint a king for themselves, and they said to the olive tree, Be our king. But the olive tree answered, Should I give up my oil by which both gods and men are honored to hold sway over the trees? And next the trees said to the fig tree, Come and be our king. But the fig tree replied, Should I give up my fruit so good and sweet to hold sway over the trees? And then the trees said to the vine, Come and be our king. But the vine answered, Should I give up my wine which cheers both gods and men to hold sway over the trees? And finally all the trees said to the thorn bush, Come and be our king. And the thorn bush said to the trees, If you really want to anoint me king over you, come and take refuge in my shade. But if not, then let fire come out of the thorn bush and consume the cedars of Lebanon. The interpretation of the story. Now, if you have acted honorably and, and in good faith, said Jotham, when you made Abimelech king, and if you've been fair to Gideon and his family, and if you've treated him as he deserves, and to think that my father fought for you, risked his life to rescue you from the hand of Midian, today you've revolted against my father's family, murdered his seventy sons in a single stone, and made Abimelech the son of his slave girl king over the citizens of Shechem, because he is your brother. If then you have acted honorably and in good faith towards Gideon and his family today, may Abimelech be your joy, and may you be his too. But if you have not, let fire come out from Abimelech and consume you, citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and let fire come out from you, citizens of Shechem and Beth Milo, and consume Abimelech. And Jotham fled, escaping to Beir. And he lived there because he was afraid of his brother Abimelech. And no wonder. And the rest of the chapter unfolds with uh, stories of uh, fighting and uh, revenge, ambush, and further ambushes. We'll just read the beginning to show what began to happen. After Abimelech had governed Israel three years, God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the citizens of Shechem, who acted treacher treacherously against Abimelech. And God did this in order that the crime against Gideon's seventy sons, the shedding of their blood, might be avenged on their brother Abimelech and on the citizens of Shechem, 
who had helped him murder his brothers. In opposition to him, these citizens of Shechem set men on the hilltops to ambush and rob everyone who passed by. And this was reported to Abimelech. He began to take revenge, and there is slaughter and counter-slaughter um, in the town and out in the fields, and then worse, in the tower. And then ultimately, Abimelech himself is crushed to death. And at the end of this gory story, we read these words in verse 56. Thus God repaid the wickedness that Abimelech had done to his father by murdering his 70 brothers. And God also made the men of Shechem pay for all their wickedness. The curse of Jotham, son of Gideon, came on them. And may God help us to understand his word to us tonight and to his name be the praise. And what a story. The stories I've been landed with on Sunday evenings seem to get worse and worse. Uh, David planned this series, obviously, with great skill and has handed me some crackers, crackers in inverted commas. Be, let me remind you um, about the book of Judges and how it records the history of Israel for us and how it records history in terms of stories. Now, that's really uh, quite interesting in our modern setup. Let me explain. Uh, an eminent modern historian, A.G.P. Taylor, has pointed out that the word for history uh, in virtually every European language apart from English is the same word for story. And he goes on to say, and others have said this as well, that there's a tremendous amount of renewed interest in history today, and modern history very often is the retelling of stories in a very personal way, pointing out the personal characteristics of the personalities who make history. And this makes me think that the book of Judges is very relevant for our times, and more so since we are told in our post-modern age that our culture promotes the telling of and the listening to stories. And stories from the past. Apparently, people no longer get inspiration from looking to the future, but rather try and learn lessons from looking to the past. And of course, we can learn from the past. I'm sure you've found that in your own lives and in your own history. Even young folks looking back on the past can learn perhaps from things that have happened. One thing that I learned from my younger days was that my sins would always find me out. I wonder if you've discovered this in life. When I pinched 30 cigarettes and six cigars from my long lost auntie in North London, I got found out two months later in my grandfather's house in Newport on Tay. Behold, your sins will find you out. And this, it seems to me, is a truth that is written into history and written in to the story in Judges chapter 9. It's almost a principle which is written in to our moral universe that if you tell porkies you'll end up eventually with egg on your face if you'll excuse the mixed metaphor. So Bible stories are very relevant and the Bible stories in Judges are extremely relevant. Even this brutal, bloody story in Judges chapter 9. Now this story is rather different from the previous ones in one particular way. 
it's different in terms of the enemies that Israel was opposed to. I wonder if you've spotted the difference as far as the enemies were concerned. Let me run through the previous four stories just to show the difference. Story number one, it was the Israelites versus the Aramites. Story number two, the Israelites versus the Moabites. Story number three, it was the Israelites versus the Canaanites. Story number four, the Israelites versus the Midianites. And here we are at story number five, the Israelites versus... Shout it all out. The Israelites. That's correct. The Israelites versus the Israelites. Quite different. The enemy within. And that's the first takeaway from this sermon tonight. There are three altogether. The first is the enemy within. The Israelite, God's people, here quarreled and fought and killed Israelites, God's people. So it was civil war. It's very striking, isn't it, that many of the wars in our times are civil wars and uh, some horrendous episodes of inhumanity and atrocity committed between peoples of the one nation. In Rwanda, the Tutsis and the Hutus massacred each other. And there are fears that this is going to happen in the Congo and perhaps other African countries. Civil war in former Yugoslavia, civil war in the former Soviet Republic and in Afghanistan with the terrible exploits of the Taliban. We don't need to look very far afield. We can think of Ireland, North versus South, Republicans and Unionists, IRA and U UDA. The enemy within. So it was for the Israelites here, and so it can be in the Christian church. If you see a burnt out car, you probably, and there are quite a few of them around, if you go down the Glen or in the back road to Mount Ellen, there's always one or two. If you see a burnt out car, you'll probably assume that somebody has torched it. My Vauxhall Cavalier uh, was pinched from the car park about 10 years ago. And Joel Henson, who's with us tonight, watched somebody drive it out of the car park at Saturday night but never said anything to anybody. <laughs> Next day it was discovered in the Coatbridge Woods, burnt out, damaged from the outside. But if you see a burnt out car lying by the side of a motorway, the damage may not have been caused from the outside. The fault may be from the inside, an electrical fault, a sparking fault, and petrol gets spilt, and, and then there's a blaze, and it's burnt out. The Israelites were battling against the enemy without, and God has intervened again and again in these previous stories to raise up leaders. But in this story, Israel is battling against the enemy within. And God intervenes to pull down the leader. So the enemy within can be equally dangerous as the enemy without. And church history is full of lessons of this kind. The Anglican Communion just now worldwide seems to be tearing itself apart over the issue of whether to ordain practicing homosexuals or not. The Free Church of Scotland in the last few years has apparently been tearing itself to pieces over a variety of issues. The enemy within. But it can happen also with a local congregation when intractable confrontation takes place between different factions over a variety of issues and usually the underlying cause is spiritual the enemy within but of course the same thing can happen within the individual lives of Christian people within a person's Christian life 
We talk about the remnants of sin, that's the expression that's used for a Christian once converted is not perfect, sin still remains, sin is, sin is still there in the life. A new government has taken place at conversion and Christ is now at the center, but sin has not been eradicated, sin is still there. But what happens when sin reasserts its authority? And this can happen when drives and urges and moods are not dealt with, but they're tolerated and perhaps even nurtured and fostered and habits are formed and habits which may remain hidden for a long time but suddenly break out with destructive force and the Christian lives with the consequences for the rest of his life. And so in all of this, the New Testament's instruction is self-examination. Know thyself and know thy God, said John Calvin at the beginning of his great Christian institutes. So there's the enemy within. The second takeaway from tonight's sermon, the warnings around. And the warnings, if we have eyes to see, are all around concerning this man Abimelech. And here's the first warning. It's a warning concerning carrying a chip on one's shoulder. Verses 1 and 2. Now we read together about Abimelech. He was Gideon's son, but his mother was not Gideon's wife. She was a concubine chapter 8 verse 31 and lived in Shechem and that I suppose is roughly the equivalent of a kept mistress uh, in last century's terms now this didn't mean that Abimelech was illegitimate but it did mean that Abimelech had no claim on Gideon's estate he wasn't mentioned in the will and he had no inheritance unlike his 70 stepbrothers now this is must have given him some kind of chip on the shoulder. His name, Abimelech, meant my father is king, and yet he'd been left nothing. So maybe it's not surprising that he carried a chip on his shoulder. But it does seem that he kept the chip, and he polished the chip, and he caressed the chip and nourished the chip on the shoulder. And as he stroked his own ambitions to get right up to the top, he started blowing his own trumpet to the people of Shechem. Which is better, he said to you, to have 70 incomers ruling over you and in charge of you or one local lad like me? And remember, verse 2, I'm your flesh and blood. Which just shows that blood can be thicker than brains. It's no good carrying a chip on your shoulder. Whatever the reason, it's always non-productive, whether it's whether it's because of one's upbringing or one's educational background or missed job opportunities or a broken or failed relationship. It doesn't do any good. And when this is combined with a very strong ambition to get to the top and then allied to blowing your own trumpet, then the outcome can be dire. Gilbert and Sullivan have a line in one of their choruses in the opera Ruddy Gore which goes like this. If you wish in the world to advance, your merits you're bound to enhance. You must stir it and stump it. You must blow your own trumpet or trust me you haven't a chance. Here's the first warning about carrying a chip on the shoulder. The second warning is in thinking that the end justifies the means. Verses 3 to 6. 
Abimelech's oratory obviously mesmerized the people of Shechem. And probably Abimelech thought he was the right man for the job. And very probably he justified the things that he did to get to the top. And so he took the money that the people of Shechem raised for him and he bought a mafia mob who very speedily got rid of his rivals. Seventy of them murdered in cold blood. And Abimelech was crowned king. And he would argue that the end, being the king, justifies the means, removing all the others. And that uh, principle has been followed many times in history. I suppose the classic and terrible example was, was Hitler in the Second World War. A man called William Shearer um, saw Hitler and heard him in September 1934 at the Nazi party celebrations in Nuremberg. And uh, this is what he says in later years. Over the years, as I listened to scores of Hitler's major speeches, I would pause in my own mind and exclaim, what utter rubbish, what brazen lies. And then I would look round at the audience. His German listeners were lapping it up. They lapped up every word as the utter truth. The end never justifies the means, whether in government or in the church, or in the life of an individual Christian who's trying to get on and cuts as many corners as he can and tries as many dodges as he can and tries to get away as, with as much as he can. But methods matter to God. It's not just what you do, but how you do it that's important to God. So there's the second warning. And then there's a third warning, and that's to do with prickly power politics. Verses 7 to 15. And it's a warning given by a prophetic voice one of the sole survivors of the slaughter and the little story that he tells. Now the scene is quite amusing here as the commentator Dale Davis points out. He says this, We watch the solemnity and the ceremony of Abimelech's coronation. All the local politicians have that grave and profound look on their faces which needs to remain until they adjourn to the Hilton for the party. Suddenly, an irreverent yell, somewhere between tenor and baritone, baritone, profanes the occasion. Hey, you guys, listen to me. And all eyes turn to see this figure, who's standing on a jutting edge of a cliff on Mount Gerizim, which, interestingly enough, was the place of blessing in Israel's history. And there stands Jotham, Gideon's son and sole survivor of the slaughter, who shouts out a story about trees and a thorn bush. And the story, we read it together, is very simple. It tells of how the fruitful, productive trees were not chosen to be king, but instead a thorn bush was chosen to be king. But what's a thorn bush ever done, for goodness sake? What does a thorn bush produce? Well, a thorn bush produces thorns, prickly thorns, prickly thorns that hurt and stab and wound in the murky world of power politics. That's Abimelech said Jotham. That's your man. So there's the warning. The warning is about following people who have little caliber, little character, and no convictions. And the world of politics can enter into the church. I was a bit taken aback several months ago when somebody who was 
a fairly new member to our church, gave an opinion on a certain issue. And then she said to me, but I don't know about the politics of what's going on in the congregation about this issue. And I was a bit taken aback. Not because I thought there was politics going on, but I think it was the assumption that she made that politics went on within the church as with every other organization and association. Let's beware of playing politics in a Christian congregation. Let's beware of having personal agendas and any scheming or planning for our ends, which in the end of the day may not be to do with God's purposes. So there's the third warning. The fourth one really follows on from that, and it's a warning about mad leadership, verses 16 to 20. And mad stands for uh, mutual assured destruction. That's a modern nuclear deterrent expression. Jotham wasn't finished after his story. He followed up by some very strong words. And what he was doing was warning everyone of mutual destruction if they, the people of Shechem and Abimelech, followed their wicked ways. Verse 20. If you continue in this way, then fire will come out from Abimelech and consume, consume you, citizens of Shechem, and fire will come out from you, citizens of Shechem, and consume Abimelech. Mutual destru destruction. It was mad. Madness. And the warning is of following those who show all the signs of destructive leadership. I was speaking this morning about, about role models and uh, I suppose many of us parents and adults are very concerned about uh, the kind of role models that are available in society for young people today. And Michael Jackson performed at the Brit Awards a few years ago. He caused a major stir by acting out a Jesus-like role, apparently without any sense of irony. And all the performance did was to demonstrate how far from reality Jackson is. And when deeply unstable characters like Jackson and Kurt Cobain are widely accepted as role models, then the outlook is bleak. So there's another warning. Four warnings given here. Warning about carrying resentment, justifying means, trusting in politics rather than principles, and having wrong role models. The enemy within the warnings around. And the third takeaway from this evening's sermon, and this is the really important one, the judgment from above. Verses 22 to 57. And that's the point of, of the story that unfolds in these verses. And it's really quite a, a racy story with a whole lot of gory details, it has to be said. And the story starts with the treachery on the part of the people of Shechem and their cynical program of ambush and robbery to spite Abimelech. Verses 22 to 25. And then there's a planned coup d'etat against Abimelech and organized by a man called Gaal who had the gall when sozzled in Baal's bar in suburban Shechem to boast to his compatriots that he would have Abimelech's guts for garters. Now that's a rough uh, paraphrase of verses 26 to 29. But the leader of the local authority of Shechem, possibly greater Shechem, a man called Zebul, was appalled at this. And he did the dirty on Gaal. And he leaked the story to the press and onwards to Abimelech. 
and Abimelech ordered his own ambush on Gaal, verses 30 to 36. And when Gaal saw he was done for, Zebul with great glee spat at him. Where's your big mouth now? And that's not a paraphrase of verse 31. 38. Where's your big talk now? And so follows slaughter in the town, verses 39 to 41, and slaughter in the surrounding fields, verses 42 to 44, and the survivors run away to a tower, a great tower called the Tower of Shechem, and Abimelech chases them and torches the tower, and it's burnt down to the ground, and 1,000 people are burnt to death. Abimelech goes to the next town, the town of Thebes, and there he carries out the same strategy, and he storms the tower in Thebes, and all the people have gone to the tower to seek refuge, and Abimelech starts to prepare to torch it again. But this time, verse 50, he's overconfident. And he goes right up to the wall, unprotected and unguarded, and a woman dropped a millstone from above onto his skull which crushed him. The woman who had a crush on him, Dale Davis rather cynically says. And Abimelech, with a sense of shame, at being wounded by a woman, calls on his armor bearer to finish him off. As you will remember, King Saul was to do some years down the track. And when the Israelites, verse 56, saw that Abimelech was dead, they went home. That's the story. And just in case you've missed the point of the story, then the narrator tells us in verse 57, Thus God repaid the wickedness that Abimelech had done. Judgment from above. That's what this story is all about. That's the lesson that we have to learn. That's why it's given to us in this part of the Bible. And God did it, verse 24. God sent it, verse 22. God's judgment. Now, this is quite a solemn uh, lesson from a very brutal kind of story. Let me say one or two things by way of conclusion about God's judgments. The first is this. It seems that God's judgments follow the course of events. We have a story here with a number of events listed one after another, human, human events. And the story is a bit like a chain with different links locked together until the final consequences. And it seems as though God's judgment operates with just the unfolding of these events, the living of them out until the consequences. And this is often the way that God's judgment works. Behold, your sins will find you out. Whatsoever a man sows, says Paul, that shall he also reap in the unfolding events that take place with their consequences. I'm sure you know these words. Sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. And so I suppose the thing here is to nip the sowing process as soon as possible. Nip the thoughts as they are sown in our minds. Nip them in the bud and deal with them there. The second thing that we can note from the story here is 
that God's judgment works when evil destroys evil. You see, there's no fellowship with evil. There is no partnership with evil. Ultimately, evil destroys evil. Shechem and Abimelech started off bonding together, but they end up destroying each other. And so evil nations will destroy evil nations. Evil factions will destroy evil factions. Evil men will destroy evil men. That, it seems, is the way God's judgment works. So we're not to be terrified and paralyzed when we look at rampant evil in the world and society around about us. And it can have that effect on us when we see things going from bad to worse and we begin to panic and say, what's going to happen? What's going to befall us? Terrified and paralyzed. And we don't really need to be like that because ultimately evil will destroy itself. Evil's days are numbered because of the process of God's judgment that is taking place in life and history and in society. And the third thing to say about God's judgment from the story here is that his judgments are carried out in order to protect his people. And that's a great positive lesson I want to finish with. Because after this terrible, brutal and sorry episode and after the death of Abimelech, we read in chapter 10 that there was a time of peace for something like uh, 23 years. And then another deliverer came along, uh, a judge, and there was peace for another 22 years. Add these two together and you've got 45 years. Now that's a tremendous blessing. And that's why God's judgment went into operation in order to bring respite to his people. And God's eye is upon his oppressed people. It always has been and always will be. God's people are the apple of his eye and his judgments in the world are in order to ultimately protect his people. And there is tremendous oppression taking place in our world today. I wonder if we realize it living in our sophisticated Scotland and very much sheltered and cocooned from persecution and trouble. Release International has published shocking figures showing that only 30% of all committed Christians live in the free Western world. The remaining 70% endure varying degrees of hardships and harassment and persecution and release international have estimated that a staggering 450 to 500 Christians are martyred for their faith every day. That's one every three minutes. And it's good to know there's a judge who sees all of this. A judge who cares and a judge who acts. And a judge who will give the enemies of his people their ultimate comeuppance. It is good to know there is a judge who saves, if not in this life, then in the life to come. It's good to know there is a God who is sovereign and ultimately in charge and that's what the book of Judges is teaching us. A God who is working his purposes out. A God who saves and that's his great and significant work in history to save people, to bless them, to love them, to protect them, to guard them and keep them and, and lead them safely to glory and judgment is his strange work which he has to do because of his commitment to his people. And that's good news. So the call tonight is to have faith in this God, to trust in him, to believe in him, even when we can't see the evidence of his work in the world and in society. Jesus said to the disciples three simple words, have 
faith in God. And yet also, we have to hold God in fear. To hold God in awe and with reverence because of who he is and because of what he does in his sovereign judgment. To revere and respect, to fear and to follow and obey him. That, I think, is the call from this story tonight, a strange story to be in the Bible, but a story which teaches us ultimately about the greatness of God, his severity and his goodness. Paul said in the New Testament, you know the severity and goodness of God. Trust in him, believe in him, commit yourselves to him. Let's pray together. Almighty and eternal God, we bow before the mystery of your presence and the mystery of your ways in life and in history. We thank you that the things that we do know far outweigh the things that we don't know. We praise you for what you have given to us of knowledge of Jesus Christ and his mighty work on the cross and his work of salvation and that great ongoing program of salvation to the end of the age and to the ends of the earth. We pray, Lord, that we might realize again the privilege of being caught up into this mighty work. And we pray that you'll help us and enable us to follow through as your servants, to be part of kingdom work in this new week which has opened up. We pray that you'll guide us and bless us in all that we do. We pray that you'll be with us and help us. And we ask that you'll enable us to trust in your sovereign providence at work. Lord, open our eyes to see the greatness of your plans and programs and purposes. And help us to take in tonight what you have wanted to bring to us as individuals. Perhaps somebody here carrying a chip on the shoulder Perhaps somebody nursing resentment and stoked with ambition. Perhaps somebody attempted to, to cut corners to get ahead. Perhaps somebody careless with urges and drives. Perhaps somebody careless with thought life. Lord, teach us that word individually we need to hear. We pray that this word from you will not return to you empty tonight but will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent and we ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen